Okay, we are coming back now. Uh, we're going to have some difficult cases, and that's how we're going to round out the show here. We're going to, we have uh, Dr. Elster uh, is going to be joining us first with a difficult case. Dr. Elster, are you there? I am. Eric, how you doing, buddy? Haven't talked to you in a long time. Yeah, a long time since uh, hospital center. Since the days at hospital center. I was commander, he's now Commander Elster. Big shot. Yeah, United I know. States it's Navy. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Elster is an Associate Professor of Surgery at Uniform Services in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, and uh, he is an uh, absolute uh, phenomenal physician and uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the greats that I've had the opportunity to work with. And uh, he is going to give us a, a brief presentation here on uh, wartime pediatric trauma complex decisions. He's going to present a case here. So Eric, why don't you start with the case? And what I'm going to do, I may stop you periodically, or you choose to stop when you want and sort of pull the audience. We have faculty from today's uh, course online, and we have the two here, so we might stop and ask the audience questions, okay? Sounds like a plan. So Perfect. I tried to pick a case. This is a case uh, from our experience this time last year in Kandahar at our Rule 3 uh, NATO hospital. Now, this was a hospital that had, and this is important, essentially all the resources we would find in a major trauma center with, you know, in the United States or Europe or Australia for that matter. Uh, and it illustrates, you know, how contemporary practice can't, although technically can be done, maybe shouldn't be done in all cases. So I'll go ahead with the case. This is an eight-year-old uh, male that was supposed to improvise explosive device blast very common injury pattern that we would see in theater. Uh, on his initial exploration, he went, you know, after stabilization in the trauma bay, uh, he went directly to the uh, operating room because of obvious evidence of uh, abdominal penetration. He did not get a CAT scan. He had multiple small bowel injuries that were treated with primary resection and primary repair. Uh, his post-operative course uh, was complicated by an abscess. Uh, requiring operative drainage, which was seen on CT scan. But after that second surgery for the drainage of these of his abscess, which was a typical interloop type abscess without any uh, evidence of uh, any missed injury at that time, he developed another fluid collection. Uh, the CT scan at that time was consistent with a mid ureteral injury, ureteral injury. And this, at this point, this posed a significant, uh, significant treatment dilemma for us. Hey, Eric. Yes. Some people are saying they're having a hard time hearing you. If you could just talk louder into the phone, I guess. Let me, well, let me put the phone to my ear. Okay. You want me to? Uh, no. Let me to put the. You want me to, to restart? Oh, much better. Or? Yeah, that's great. No. Do you want me up. to restart? Yes. No. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway, just a quick, quick summary. Very quick summary. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, eight-year-old IED blast, initial exploration, multiple small bowel injuries, treated with primary re resection and primary repair, post-operative course with a standard interloop type abscess, requiring uh, re-exploration and operative drainage. Subsequent to that second operation, this uh, child develops a fluid collection uh, on CT scan that's consistent with a mid ureteral injury, and then we're faced with a decision. Uh, the decision here was to, whether to go ahead and attempt to technically repair this ureteral injury or not. Now, at the time, we did not have the appropriate size stents, but that was not an issue. We could have had those sent from, you know, FedEx essentially uh, from the states. We didn't have a, you know, a, a pediatric cystoscope or any cystoscope for that matter, but we could have basically sutured the stent to a Foley catheter and left it in place for several weeks and pulled it out. You know, so I think we could have mitigated the uh, short-term issues and, and the technical exercise of repairing a ureteral injury was well within our technical expertise, either from myself as a transplant surgeon or my partner there that was a trauma surgeon. The issue uh, for us at the point was there was, within the country of Afghanistan, there's no pediatric urology and there's no mid to long-term follow-up for a child like this. So we proceed, you know, we looked at the options and we proceeded to do a unilateral nephrectomy. 
you. So, Dr. Mayer, what, what would you think about that if you saw this patient? Uh, uh, Go ahead. Yes. I think in, in this setting it's a very wise solution uh, because I think uh, the other options uh, to, to repair this uh, ureter would be uh, would end up in a stricture possibly, and this uh, is very hard to treat in this setting. And uh, a so a hitch procedure with a bladder anchoring uh, uh, and uh, reimplantation of this ureter, uh, this also can be very complicated. I think in this situation, uh, I would have done the same. Is uh, Jean Michel Guise, is he on still? He Are you on? He should be on the phone. Are you on, Dr. Guise? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, I, am, I am on the phone, but I, I, I work just uh, for, uh, for one hour in order to do a uh, kidney graft. And so I just arrived. Oh, you just got. This is an eight year old kid injured in an IED blast had a, several other problems, that, so, but by day 21 they realized ureteral injury, and oh, the yeah. question is, they could fix it with some, some makeup stuff, but there's no way to follow up on the kid and see if it has a, uh, he has a stricture, or uh, could it get a stricture and polynephritis, or move it down, follow it up at all with any sort of health care post-acute care, and the question really is, would you agree with the option of doing an nephrectomy unilaterally, or is there some unique way to do the follow-up that people haven't thought of? Uh, it, it probably depends on the, uh, the, the site of the stenosis. Okay. Where, where, where is, it, it was in emergency or it was after, after the trauma? It was post-op. Much later. It's several weeks much later. later. Uh, so, and, and what what was the site of the, of the stenosis, of the ureter stenosis? It was the mid-portion of the ureter. In the it, wasn't a stenosis. Or, uh, it wasn't a stenosis. It was an, it was injury. an injury. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, okay. No, our concern was, you know, the, because we were doing this in Afghanistan, with the lack of any real, with the lack of any pediatric urological follow-up, exactly as the other speaker pointed out, the subsequent development of stricture in this child could be real, could be catastrophic. So we elected to do the nephrectomy rather than repair, which was within our technical means. Uh huh. John Michel, what would you do? Well, it depends. It depends. If I can, we, we, we have done uh, sometimes we have done uh, um, ureter replacement by the appendix. But uh, if if the child cannot have the uh, pediatric uh, follow-up, uh, probably if the uh, if the bladder is a, is a very big bladder, you can you can try to make a psoasic and try to, to see if there is some, some uh, possibility to, to, to descend the ureter and to anastomosis to the bladder. If it's too high and, it's, and, 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 and if the baby uh, has no the, the possibility to have a follow-up, probably the, uh, the, the kidney nephrectomy will be an option. The second option will be uh, to do a transuretal ureterostomy between the left kidney and, and, and the right kidney. If you have uh, enough ureter at the upper part of the, uh, of the ureter, below the, the, the calyx. You see what I mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, technically for this type of injury, if we were back here, you know, from the transplant perspective, you know, a either, you know, the first attempt would be obviously so as itch and try to repair over a stent. But if that was not possible, auto transplantation down to the pelvis uh, would be a great option. But, uh, you know, again, our, you know, with the lack of any ability to follow this yeah, patient yeah, yeah. beyond, you know, a couple of months, you know, uh, we elected to do the nephrectomy. And it was a very difficult decision because you're taking out a completely normal kidney. And, and for something in the, in the Western world, we could have treated it and, and many parts of the developing world. But in, in, unfortunately, in Afghanistan, uh, there lack any infrastructure uh, beyond basic care. Yeah, but you, you have, as you say, you have, uh, um, 
you have, as you, as you say, uh, to take care of the situation, you see. Yes, and the situation in this case, you, you, you go to the nephrectomy and probably it's, it's, it, it, it was a good option. I, I agree with that. I, I think tough, tough situation, very heart-wrenching as a care team to have to make these sorts of hard decisions when to do this, but I, I think you probably made the smartest thing. And it, and you still have to live with the doubts of should I have done something different. And I guarantee you if you'd done something different, you'd live with the doubts of should I have just taken the kidney out. Yeah. yeah. No, not, it, it just wasn't a good way out of it with where there was just a – Hundred percent likelihood of a good result. I want to. We're gonna. I want to in a minute. Move on to the next case, but I know. I would just uh, say I would. Have, I totally agree with what he did. I, you know, keeping right. things simple, keep it practical, and just assume that nobody's ever going to get. Followed up by anybody yeah. uh, is 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 the way to support and take care of uh, kids in any developing country. No matter where you send them, you have to plan for that probability that no one will ever see them again. And I I think this will come up more and more as we send teams with resources. You know, it's one thing if you're in a if you're in a humanitarian assistance mission and you're operating in a tent or in a very store environment and you don't have very much, and you technically can't do it. However, you know when we have you know, robust tra uh, trauma hospital in, in theater, or we have hospital ships like the Comfort of the Mercy that go out or, you know, th that right. have the technical right. capabilities to do things. You, it's not nearly a matter of fact of can I do this, but should I do this? I, it's yeah. innocent, though, of years back when we would identify all these mangled lower extremities, which we could salvage technically, but which would be worse than the uh, average prosthesis in the end for the patient. It's very similar to that. It's, 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 is it wise to do it just because you can? But I think the only, only counterpoint that I would make is that I might defer the decision depending on, you know, I might, I might not make cross the Rubicon and say, I'm not going to do it until I tried it, saw what kind of a result I had. And then maybe defer my 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 uh, decision for another couple of a week too, until I realized that there was really no way to go, and I would have taken the kidney out then. So I might have deferred and done a, a secondary operation. All right, that was a fantastic discussion. Uh, Dr. Elster, thank you for that case. Obviously, but I want to move on. Thanks, Eric, for joining us today. Um, my pleasure. Hey, uh, Eric, can you stay on the phone to make comments as a panelist as well for the next yep. case? Thank I'm you. Yeah, everybody stay on. Let's see who's here. Okay, perfect. We got Dr. Bird from Children's National Medical Center. Uh, Randy Bird is the Chief of Trauma and Burns at Children's National Medical Center, Associate Professor of Surgery and Pediatrics at George Washington. Randy, are you there? there? Yes, can you hear me? We can. I do have some pause points. A uh, 13-year-old uh, was riding his bike, sustained a gunshot wound to his right flank. Uh, the, the only pre-hospital information of any relevance was the possibility of hypotension at the scene. Um, basically, he had some abdominal pain, mild tenderness, an entry wound on the right flank, but no apparent other um, uh, uh, entry or exit wound, and they had a normal neurologic exam. You can go to the next slide. And so the question is, um, is this a patient that, uh, how, would, how would people manage this patient? What kind of imaging? And I think most would get, go to the next slide. Well, wait, whoa, wait, 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 hold on. Whoa, I'm going to give, give people a pre, I'll, get, I'll give people to get a chest x-ray. So we'll, okay. we'll do that. Okay, so I'll show the next slide. This is a chest x-ray. Okay, okay, so now, so now I'll ask the question, what is, is, What's your next step from, from this point? All right, so by the way, it's fine. Dr. Basso in Brazil. In Brazil. Are you there from Brazil, Dr. Basso? Okay. Uh, considering the, 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 I would perform a CAT scan. CAT scan. Is there anyone here? 
I don't know if all the faculty mics are unmuted, but hopefully they are, because I want you to speak out whenever you want to. If there's anyone that would disagree with getting a CAT scan, what about the two of you? You okay with a CAT scan at this point? I got to tell you, I do a lot more adult trauma than pediatric trauma. Uh huh. If I, if I, that just looks like a work order to me. Yeah, I might be willing to argue to do a laparoscopy and look and see if it went in somewhere, but considering that could be retroperitoneum, I might get another lateral film to see if that if the missile ended in anterior or posterior position. I might do something like that, but I'm thinking operating room for this. Oh, uh, right. wait, 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 wait. Dr. Powell to the operating room at Wake Forest. Well, I, I don't think Wayne attends on pediatric trauma. Wait right. for it, so. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do, Dr. Petty? Would you would you agree? So we have laparotomy, CT scan, or other x-rays. You know, it, in the real world, if he's stable, I, I don't see a lot of harm to getting a CT scan. I, I don't think you would likely talk yourself out of an operation, but um, sometimes you want to be there. Vascular surgery or ortho or neurosurgery, you know, looking at where that thing ends, it might be nice to let them know before you get there. Jean Guy in France, what would you do? Jean Michel. Hi. What would you do with this child? Well, probably uh, if, he, if he is uh, in a very good condition, why not to do a CT scan? But probably. We, we are not a lot of gunshots uh, uh, in in Marseille, and probably I will uh, I will uh, I will do a laparotomy. Laparotomy? Mm. This is, yeah, this is this is Randy Bird. Uh, you know, let me. There's some questions on the line. Uh, the, what's the heart rate and blood pressure? They were normal. Oh. Um, so that's the question that some people asked. Yeah, Jeremy, call in so you can voice your concerns here. Jeremy Cannon wants to do a uh, a fast exam. What are your thoughts, Randy, on doing a fast exam? I, I, yeah, so I, I wonder what added information a fast exam is going to is is not is going to be unique information that will help this to determine uh, operative management or non-operative management well, or the if, strategy of operative management. If you saw a lot of fluid, would you still get a CT scan? I, I, I think that, well, we, we'll get to a little of the punchline here. I, I think a CT scan in a stable patient like this provides uh, added information that can help in operative planning. Um, I knew it was, and, if it was your case. Well, we, we've got a lot of guys already going to laparotomy. We've got Dr. Uh, um, Villamazar, Joaquin, are you, you're not on the phone, are you? No. You would take them right to surgery. And then we have another uh, surgeon here, Dr. Martinez, who wants to do laparoscopy. And uh, Dr. Cannon Dr. wants to Dr. do, Cannon wants to do window. a pericardial window. And uh, so this, this poor kid is going to get everything. He wants to do a fast look at the pericardial. All right, so <laughs> Randy, what did you do here? Well, let's look at the next slide. In yeah, fact, uh, and, uh, there's some good comments on the... Uh, so, so here we did, I did did choose to do in fact a um, GT scan of the abdomen, and you can see that the bullet which you saw on the uh, the plane film is causing some uh, uh, artifact. Um, but the, the one of the remarkable things, uh, so it's sort of basically at the at the, the very top of the liver near the um, hepatic veins, and uh, if you take a look at the uh, pericardium, there's fluid uh, in the pericardial sac. So I guess my See, next question. My Dr. Cannon was right. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to do a fast. He wanted to yeah, I'm vindicated. Up. Great. <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> yeah, I finally, uh, finally got uh, connected. <laughs> All right, keep going. What'd you do, Randy? So our right. approach has been to uh, to do a pericardial window on such an operating the operating room, have them all prepped up before general anesthesia, and then uh, you're ready to go. He's prepped, induce anesthesia, and then get ready for a pericardial pericardial window. And uh, then if he becomes unstable, you're ready for a, a sternotomy or in some cases a, a clamshell. Jeremy, is that you talking? Yeah. Okay. And what about the what about the belly? Uh, so great question. I don't see the uh, that there's.
there's any evidence of uh, caval or hepatic vein involvement, uh, but I'd like to know about that. Uh, if I suspected that, I would plan for a, a um, stem to stern, sternotomy and laparotomy. If I did not suspect that, then I would be uh, you know, more inclined to start with pericardial window and, and uh, look at the pericardium first. Yeah, before you did that stem to stern, would you laparoscope them maybe? Mm. Uh, so, uh, no, I would not. Okay. Eric, are you there? Yes. So, you said intraoperative pericardial window, I'm assuming? Yes. And what else would you do? I mean, just as described, the window and then, uh, you know, and then be prepared to do your sternotomy. This is where your CAT scan was extraordinarily helpful. If you don't have, if you don't, if you don't, have, if you're not comfortable, uh, and then if you, you know, and if you suspect intra-abdominal injury, then you're prepared for that as well. Just that one comment about the liver. It looks like this is one where you might even consider non-operative management of the liver, but you've got to deal with the the pericardial fluid. But well, there's no tamponade physiology, is there? No, not at all. Not yet. So what about just taking it all the pediatric way and say, oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> get no him a way. video game, get, right. get him a Nintendo and see what he does over <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. Hey. Step to Stern or watch? <laughs> a Nintendo video game or Step to Stern? Let's pick one. You want a sternolaparotomy or Mario? <laughs> Yeah, I think with pericardial fluid, you have to take that very seriously and um, uh, do some sort of intervention. And so Cynthia me, Jenkins it, agrees with you. Cynthia Jenkins says, admit to the ICU and watch if there's no symptoms. Is that crazy? Yeah, I'm just curious. It is. I think I, what's that? It is. <laughs> is Cynthia going to sleep next to the patient in right. the ICU with a knife in her hand? Mm -hmm. Cynthia, call in and talk yeah. to her. I, I like sleeping in my own bed at home. How about that? And, and you knowing that I've found all the injuries, and I know. So how about what would you guys? Would I'm you with guys you. Buy, would you buy a, a like a a, a a percutaneous catheter just to drain whatever's there diagnostically without doing a window? Kid no. stable. You wouldn't do that. No, I would not. Okay. So, all right, so Randy. Go, man. Let's, so let's, let's, so let's, if, let's, if there's blood in the pericardial, I was, I'm a card carrying thoracic surgeon, so I'll. <laughs> I don't think about whether that's right, but but so uh, there, if there's blood in the pericardial sac, they're, they're okay. <laughs> right? well, well put. Well put. And 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 the, and, the, and the thing is, right now maybe it's right sided. It's an atrium. It's RV, which looks like it's going to be the bottom of the RV. And it's a little bit hypovolemic, and the CVP is not very high, and the right heart pressures aren't very strong, and he hasn't had any atelectasis, so that his, his um, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance is as good as it's going to be for a while. But over time, any of those things can change. A little bit more RV pressure pops it off, and then, and then all of a sudden the kid's in tamponade, right? So that's your worry. That's why... You, you probably need to do something about this. Randy, keep going. What happens now? Yeah, let's go to that. Let's go to the next slide here. So, what? Sorry. Hold okay. On. Uh, so, so, so here's here's some of the choices. I think people came up with most of these, and they go to the next slide. So, I guess I guess I have a problem sleeping, and I I I don't sleep well, so I try to do everything that I can to improve my sleeping. So, <laughs> so. I did an upper midline. Uh, we did an upper midline incision and uh, did a uh, uh, window. And here's the interesting thing: is that there was no apparent diaphragmatic defect, uh, but yet there was clearly dark blood in the pericardium. And I, there was absolutely no evidence of de de uh, any kind of defect in the pericardium. So now, what would you do? Hmm. And uh, let me just add: the liver, the liver injury is just a bullet that was embedded in the. Uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, in the right lobe of the liver uh, with a tr with a, uh, uh, a tract if it wasn't bleeding. So I would leave a pericardial drain, wash it out, leave a pericardial drain, seal that bullet in the liver. Don't mess with it. Clean out the blood in the belly. Put a drain around the liver holes, maybe, and then uh, go home and sleep pretty good. Or at least leave a resident there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Can I, can I, I, I don't want to get too off topic, but there was a question asked, and I'm very curious because I don't know what, what everyone else here does. These patients, there was a question about assessing the urinary system. Do you get on-table IVPs, or what, what do you do? The CAT scan helps because you don't need to do that. You get the CAT scan, you've got your CT IVP. Um, that's, one, that's actually the main reason I get CAT scans on these stable gunshot victims, because that's my IVP. I'm just curious if, uh, if anyone disagrees with that or if anyone does on-table IVPs or what. On-table IVP really is a, a test re restricted to patients who have to hurry up quick into the operating room uh, and, you, and, you have, uh, and you have some issue intraoperatively that you want to evaluate with, uh, with an IVP. And then you can't get in with a condition. Right. So that's one advantage of getting the CT in these kids if they're stable. Right. Um, so, all right. So, so, yeah. so what are we doing here with this patient? This patient is, uh, is now doing what? Uh, Randy, what did you do? So um, I closed. Uh, did you, you put a drain did you leave a pericardial drain? No. No, I, 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 I stood and looked at it a long time. And, so um, so when, when you walk, does the sound of that brass clanking bother you? <laughs> <laughs> I think Wayne's, Wayne's I, took, I thought I took a conservative approach, but I think that Wayne might have beat me out in the conservative uh, strategy for this. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened with the child? Uh, the kid did fine. Yeah, the kid did great. <laughs> it, it, you know, and really in retrospect, uh, uh, this injury, um, if you had chosen not to operate on this patient, the patient probably would have done perfectly fine. Yeah, see Cynthia? Cynthia wants to put the patient in the ICU. She would have been right. She wants to take care of that patient. This patient, this patient got surgery. could have just gone and gotten a swan. Did Who's you, did you get, get a follow-up echo? Yeah. The, the kid could have gone yeah, on to get tampon yeah, out. It's in pericardial I, blood. I think I think that what you did was the absolute perfect thing. Uh, it's interesting to hear about putting in the pericardial drain. I think there's a little downside to that. Um, and I think that this was a wonderful case. And uh, as you can see, we didn't even want to keep going because it brought up a lot of good issues. Right. I want to go. We have a, three more cases. I want to go on. But if, is there any okay. last questions or comments before we go on? Did you get a follow-up echo? No. I Who's that asking? Probably a good, uh, probably Rob Sheridan. Sheridan yeah, wants to know. No follow up echo. Okay. Would Dr. You, Dr. Brasso, do you have any other thoughts about this since you wanted to get the CT scan early? No. I, I, I agree with the panel after seeing it all. All right. Okay. Uh, by the way, that pericardial drain most likely, unless you're putting a big sucker in, is going to be clotted off and not giving you any output on the bleeding anyways unless it's, I mean, it's going to clot off. Well, what kind of pericardial? So, so pericardial drain won't do tamponade from um, it's, uh, if, if a, there's a hole in the heart that appears, right? right but it right. will it will show you that it's appearing. You're saying because it, it would be bleeding into the drain you, you, if it's not clotted. In off. the beginning, it will do that, right? It, it, but you put an angled chest tube in the pericardium and uh, bring it out just like you do every time you do a heart case. Okay. And and that that's right. that's okay. decent. The kids it's are safe. small okay. and it's safe. But it, but it also keeps fluid. Right? It keeps keeps serous effusion from filling up. So um, I, I agree with you. I think that I just wanted to be devil's advocate. So we're going on to the next case here. You know, I, uh, Randy, great case. Thank you very much. Stick on the line so you can give your input. Okay. Okay. Um, next case is from Wolfgang Stair, who's a pediatric surgeon, uh, Children's Hospital and Research Center in Oakland. Uh, in Oakland, California, and uh, Wolfgang, welcome. Hi there, Todd. How are you? Hey, is uh, Jim Betts there with you? Yes, he's sitting right here next to me, and maybe later after he can make some comments as a uh, assistant panelist. Yeah, we want to hear what he has to say, because we missed him on the earlier panel. But uh, Wolfgang, uh, I, I appreciate you joining us. Wolfgang was uh, uh, also, like myself, uh, is a product of Children's National Medical Center and is really doing a lot of great stuff over in Oakland, so he's going to give us a very tough case here. Yes, let me first congratulate you to our outstanding symposium. This is really fantastic, and thank you for letting us be part of this. Thank this you. case is a case of a five-year-old boy who was riding a bicycle down a hill. At the bottom of the hill, he hit a gate and had a classic handlebar injury. At the same time, he hits his head against the gate, breaks his helmet, and loses consciousness. 
he was heli um, helivacked to our emergency department. Um, this is just the classic mechanism of handlebar injury where the front wheel of the bicycle turns 90 degrees, aligns the handlebar usually between the object and the patient's abdomen, and the patient showed up with a classic um, right upper abdominal, right lower chest bruise. On arrival in the emergency department, the patient was crying, was talking, was complaining of abdominal pain, was complaining of trouble breathing and with a respiratory rate of about 30, his heart rate in the 160s, blood pressure of 70 to 30, and then he loses consciousness and we got involved. Our differential diagnosis with this type of scenario was, is it a head injury because he did split his helmet and did lose consciousness? Did he have a cardiac injury because the lower chest trauma of his handlebar with subsequent tamponade? Did he just have a simple tension pneumothorax or was there some type of intra-abdominal injury? Do you want me to continue? Do you want to have Yeah, yeah, keep going. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with operating, so why don't we, uh, it, not, what? What do you want to hold off go for? What do you want? Yeah, you know, I just want to ask uh, Dr. Mayer, what, what would you do with this youngster? Yeah, I think uh, I would also go to laparotomy because uh, in bringing this child to the CT in this instable, uh, unstable condition is very dangerous. Well, obviously, you know, the issue that I'm assuming you got to... Uh, I Correct. think we can take this okay. in the operating room. Right. You can do this in the operating room. So you would... Interesting. So you wouldn't even waste time with the x-ray. You'd go to the operating room and get the x-ray in the OR. Yes, yes. I would like to do this in the operating room, and uh, then I can uh, control the position of the airway tube also. I'm just curious if anyone else, I wonder, I'm not hey, sure John. I would do the same thing. John, John, what would you do, John? John Perry. Well, I, I'd be hey. curious to know what his neuro exam is aside from passed out. I mean, if he's got blown pupils or something else, I, I think you'd want to think twice about which compartment you need to open. Um, I think it's on the on the list. So I, that would be my question as to what his neuro exam is other than passed out. Wolfgang, what about his neuro exam? Yes, yeah, so on arrival he was talking, he had equal pupils, he was complaining, and then he passed out. Um, as he passed out, his blood pressure dropped to 40s, um, and his you know, respiratory rate remained very high. His heart rate, when I first stepped into room, was around 170. Um, this kind of all happened simultaneously. Um, one nurse had um, obtained intraosseous IV access, and we started um, our massive blood transfusion protocol with um, packed blood cells, FFPs. Meanwhile, a chest X-ray had been obtained. The anesthesiologist did intubate the patient as he passed out, and the emergency room fellow did a fast exam which showed that his pericardium was clean and also showed a significant amount of fluid in his abdomen. So can I, I just want to stop here because that, that answers a question. So the x-ray, I think the issue there is it could take time. However, if it was a tension pneumo for whatever reason, that would be a problem that you could treat. It's probably not going to be a tension pneumo. And a fast might be, and I'm looking at Cynthia Reyes and Matt Shaw who both are saying, yelling out, fast, 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 and I see why that makes sense. A quick look at the pericardium, and you could get the chest x-ray in the OR, but you know there's not going to be a pneumo because you, you're listening to equal sounds. Is there, do you agree with that? I do agree with okay. that. I think this is a great case for fast. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks. This is uh, Jeremy Cannon. Just, I think the, uh, the point about um, starting blood product transfusion is really important. Uh, you can start that in the trauma bay, and that really gives blood immediately available in our trauma bay, which I think most centers do, but uh, you should really uh, use that aggressively, as we've heard earlier in the day. Correct. So this case actually does confirm and underscore many of the strategies that were addressed earlier during the symposium. And to me, the FAST exam really helped me the most, knowing that um, the heart was fine and chances were the problem was somewhere in the belly. And um, on the way to the OR, I called in the backup team, and we were in the OR in a matter of about 15 minutes after we got involved. Okay. So what next? So what next? The anatomy and get back to it in a second. Um, a laparotomy and found a huge amount of blood that we scooped out with both hands, packed all four quadrants, 
and try to give anesthesia a little moment to catch up. Um, the patient at this point had already received um, three or four units of packed red blood cells. After the abdomen was packed, there was no more bleeding. However, there was also no hemodynamic stability. Um, we took one after the other packs out and did not see any bleeding. There was no liver injury. There was no splenic injury. There was no injury to the bowel that we could see. And so far, we could not explain the large amount of blood. So after I took the last pack out between the liver and the diaphragm, blood started welling up quite rapidly in the, <laughs> you know, super <laughs> Um, so it was very likely that this was a retrohepatic vena cava injury and we needed control. We did perform a Pringle maneuver at first, which did not slow down the bleeding. We then repacked that space because it seemed to have some type of tamponade effect. However, vascular stability was never established. Then I performed a um, midline sternotomy um, and opened the pericardium. And then we clamped the intrapericardiac, infracardiac um, IVC hmm. and exposed the IVC above the renal vein to have a complete hepatic vascular isolation. At that point, the bleeding stopped. The only problem was we still had the IO in the kid's lower extremity, and so whatever blood product we were giving didn't make it back to the kid's. heart. So we had to put two um, jugular vein central catheters. And now the situation was a bit more stable, you but we were looking right at... You can stick it right into your appendage while you're doing that too sometimes, that pickle. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You could just poke it, you could just stick something in the right atrial appendage sometimes too if you're in that spot is a great quick access once you have the pericardium open. I was already scared enough. <laughs> <laughs> So now we're looking at this retrohepatic vena cava injury, and it was truly right in this position um, over here. Let me see if I can use the pointer um, here. I could look at the left hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, and the right hepatic vein. The right hepatic vein seemed to be the only one that was still somewhat attached to the vena cava. However, the other two were completely evolved. Do you want to come and repair oh, Okay, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Elster, what would you do now? What were your thoughts? For this off speaker. Well, first of all, uh, tough injury, obviously. Um, it sounds like those are not amenable to repair. Is that correct? Well, that's what they were thinking. The issue was, you know, what's the next step? They've got it isolated. They've got the bleeding under control. Yeah, but it sounds like the type of what, what he's describing, it's not you know, it's not something that you can, you know, easily repair. You know, well, you, sort of typically, if the liver's not cracked completely in two, this injury sort of occurs from pulling the liver down very quickly, and it's a, a almost an avulsion injury, and it, it leaves a little bit of a flap of hepatic veins and a tear in the vena cava that can be repaired, sometimes even just sewn back up without even having to put a patch of anything on it. I mean, if it's something you can repair, it, obviously you repair it, uh, but, you know, it's, you know, that's the decision that you see as you're, you know, as you're there. Right. So, so what did, you know, what did, you know, as, since you had control of it and you started to look at it, what were you staring at? So Wolfgang, so, were you looking at half of vena cava? Yeah, we were looking at about 15, 20 percent of back wall of the vena cava with a few flaps that didn't look like they wanted to come together in any right. way. And since I was already looking at the heart and looking at big blood vessels coming out of the heart, I asked our vascular surgeon for some assistance. And he was kind enough to come in and looked at it and said, well, we'll just sew on a patch. And he got a piece of bovine pericardial patch. We oversewed the left hepatic vein. And then we sutured the patch and recreated the somewhat anterior, superior portion of the torn vena cava and sewed it back together. As soon as it was sewn back together, um, we unclamped and released our vascular isolation and had pretty good blood flow and no significant bleeding. So did you, did you clamp the vena cava just below the atrium? I clamped it just below the atrium, inside the pericardium, right. and below the liver, and a Pringle. 
And how that how long did that last? The clamp maneuver, an hour? Um, yeah, probably an hour and a half. The whole procedure between ER and ICU took about three hours and ten minutes. Um, the arriving in the ICU, the patient was severely coagulopathic because he had gotten a bunch of blood products. This is a picture of my boss here taking a look at the case. I couldn't even take a picture. He needs a haircut. Um, anyway, two comments I want to make about this. We did ligate the left hepatic vein because it was evolved and not um, re-implantable. And this is an MRI of the child about six months later where you can see that the left lobe is somewhat atrophied. The middle lobe is draining a bit through a vein that's coming out of the right hepatic vein. And um, however, beyond four or five days, he never bumped his hepatic enzymes. However, another brief comment about the mass transfusion protocol, the patient received about eight liters of blood product during the case with a blood volume of only one liter, which is a you know, eight-fold um, yep. complete blood transfusion. And then in the ICU, he was still coagulopathic. We left the abdomen open. We are in a very dire situation until about 3 in the morning when we had given him 20 units of packed red blood cells, one-to-one -one with FFP and cryoprecipitate and factor 7. And we were standing there discussing whether this was futile because he was still bleeding out of every orifice. And at that point, the patient opened his eyes and looks at us, and it was pretty clear that he wanted us to continue. <laughs> <laughs> so we gave him a third dose of factor 7, and somewhat in the next hour, the bleeding stopped. And after a total of 20 blood transfusions with the above-mentioned product, things stabilized. And um, we eventually skin grafted him, and he made it home. Now, he really did survive because we had a fantastic team here that involved the ER, the trauma team, OR, our ICU, our cardiologist, and I'm going to take off his skin graft of his belly in a few weeks. And um, he gives me one thumb up because he's quite happy. He's going to one thumb, thumb down because I didn't let him ride his bicycle yet. <laughs> uh, uh, can, I make, can I make two comments? I mean, first of all, this was a great save, but I think you made two fantastic decisions in the operating room, the first of which was to, you know, get into the pericardium, and get, you know, and, and aim for uh, control of the cava above the injury. And then the choice of uh, the bovine pericardium as, you know, your, your option for repair. If you attempted to, you know, get a piece of vein in a child of that size or any, even in an adult, the time that you took would have, ta you know, would have taken too long. And those were just two re really astute decisions that saved this kid's life. Fantastic case. Yeah, that's great. What, uh, you have any comments, uh, Dr. Basso? No, uh, just to to add that the, the the outcome was outstanding, and it's a lesson for all of us that children they always can surprise us. Even the most difficult situations, we should always uh, trust them and do whatever we can because after so much amount of blood and and components, the kid survived in in, in a good fashion, and also that uh, the the strategy of uh, investing in the patient and also using, I believe, I presume you use the VAC system, and I think it was uh, fantastic. Um, I, I wonder, we we're, we're have uh, Wolfgang. Thank you. We're going to try to squeeze in the last couple cases before our time up here. Um, thanks for the great case, Wolfgang. Thank you, Todd. Um, That's outstanding. Dr. Betts, wait a second. Dr. Betts, you have any comments? <coughs> A few comments. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate Todd and Marty and everybody else. Fantastic conference. I think some of the issues that are really pointed out here as well is that we're a standalone hospital. So when we say we had a vascular surgeon come in, it's actually our cardiac surgeon we called in. Uh, and it, it, it poses some difficulties, even when we were talking this morning about vascular injuries, uh, whether peripheral or central, or we've seen a number of supracondylar fractures with uh, brachial artery injuries. Uh, the, the trouble is when you're a children's hospital and you're not juxtaposed facility, many of us, although we do as much as we can, we don't really do a lot of vascular surgery. And this is one great case also where actually there were three, um, four pediatric surgeons in on the case and we had our cardiac surgeon. For the elbows, we often have our 
plastic surgeon uh, uh, come in as well. We just had a two-year-old with a two-millimeter brachial artery she had to do under, under a microscope. So I think these kinds of cases and this kind of, of coordination, uh, even when it's the chest or abdomen, really uh, takes teamwork. And I think it's something that in this day and age with reimbursement and everything else, it's very hard, as everybody knows, to find people, at least here in the United States, to cover uh, some of these very, very minimally used, but, but ultimately have to be there types of specialists. So um, we were very pleased. This is a very, very fortunate uh, case for us, because as everybody knows, there's probably 80, 90 percent mortality with this type of injury. And congratulations. That's fantastic. fantastic. You guys, really well great done. teamwork. Made us yeah. proud as surgeons. All right, we're going to move on to the next case. Dr. Uh, Mid Park, are you there? Perfect. Uh, we'll have you present your case now. This is a uh, very common athletic injury to the head, um, one head and uh, spleen in shock. Actually, uh, my difficult case presentation is on uh, my experience in Afghanistan with a wartime decompressive craniectomy. Okay. <laughs> That's better. That's I apologize. Better. I like that better. Um, just a quick disclosure. And just as an introduction, I had the privilege of uh, being deployed with uh, Dr. Elster in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Um, and when we look back at our series, we had uh, 13 pediatric uh, patients with severe head injuries that we treated operatively. Um, you can see that. Uh, the majority of them were uh, severe head injury patients. All right. Well, I guess that was worth it. It was outstanding. Um, just uh, quickly, this first case, a, a three-year-old local national boy, he was unfortunately caught in a crossfire and had a gunshot wound to the head, entered in the left occipital region, and the bullet tracked to the left frontal lobe, and it was still retained. Um, he was GCO 7T on arrival. These patients generally go to the nearest uh, um, medical outpost, and, and there they get their initial trauma resuscitations or subsequently intubated if necessary and then transferred to wherever um, the nearest uh, level of care, the next higher echelon care is with the appropriate resources. Um, initially I tried to manage him conservatively, put an EBD in and uh, drain the CSF, but unfortunately despite that overnight he continued to have significant uh, ICP issues into the 25-30 range despite uh, maximal sedation and, and what uh, maximizing our resources. So because of that, you know, he was taken to the OR. Uh, I did a uh, decompressive craniectomy on him and kind of see some of the intra photos with the entry wound and uh, also the, the diffuse swelling of that cerebral hemisphere. Um, again, part of the reason I think that uh, Dr. Elster alluded to previously is we, even though we had a lot of resources at our hospital, we really have to think down the line what is going to happen to this, uh, this boy because um, the, the need to repatriate these patients back to the, the host nation facilities is pretty strong um, and unfortunately their resources are extremely limited and they have uh, almost no real capability to take care of neurologically injured patients. So that does lead to a, a very make that decision whether or not it's worthwhile to, to proceed with any type of treatment at all. Um, and, and guess at what could happen in the future, whether or not they're going to get all the care that they need. Um, I tended to be more aggressive just on my end, uh, just to give them the maximal chance possible. Um, so this uh, child after surgery, his ICPs came down. We were able to extubate him actually pretty rapidly. Um, over the course of his hospitalization, um, he did improve quite a bit, although he did have a residual right hemispheresis. We have no, pretty much no immediate or long-term follow-up again uh, due to the limitations in that, uh, in that environment. And again, a lot of the questions that we ran into is at what point do we say it's futile, where as in the U.S., I think, or in any Western or developed nation, I should say, we may be more aggressive because we know that we can take care of these kids in the long term. But I think in certain environments like that, it, it really does, um, you really do have to think long and hard about uh, what potentially can happen uh, later on. Um, so this youngster went home? Uh, well, he was actually transferred to the local national hospital um, after after his stay with us. Those are heart-wrenching heart decisions. You did a good job. Um, a quick one. This 10-year-old local national boy, um, he fell uh, down a well 
probably about 30 meters that they, uh, 20, 30 meters that they estimate. Uh, GTS was 60, again, same scenario initially presented to an outside institution. We don't, um, in the trauma bay, really have to make that decision. Uh, in the previous case, is this something that you want to watch or is something you want to take uh, immediately? This was actually an open depressed skull fracture, which is uh, one of a, it's a very strong indication for surgery. And looking at this, you can kind of see the extent of the fracture that he has, a, a very complex comminuted fracture. It's something that potentially could have tried to primary, primarily fix and just do a craniotomy, take care of the hematoma, some um, you know, hemostasis and leave it at that and try and write him out as a craniotomy without removing a skull defect. But again, have to think this is an individual who is going to subsequently be transferred to, uh, again, a local national hospital. And the decision then is what resources do they have to take care of him if he, delay, if he develops any type of ICP issues, um, they, they really have no resources to take care of that. So in this instance, again, whether or not uh, this would be something I would do in a situation like here in San Diego, I think I would have handled it differently. But over there, I was more aggressive because of, again, some of the limitations that we have and just elected to proceed with a decompressed craniectomy. Um, fortunately, this is actually one of the few children that did come back uh, later on, um, and he was doing, uh, he was GCS 11 at the time of his discharge, but uh, he, he made his way back um, about five months later and I was able to do a cranioplasty on him. He does have right-sided hemiparesis, but uh, otherwise he's ambulating and uh, this was, uh, again, this is, this is kind of gratifying in the sense that we got a little bit of follow-up and we saw that uh, they could, uh, that these kids could, you know, continue on and, and have a meaningful uh, recovery afterwards. Fantastic. Fantastic. Outstanding. So um, again, just looking at our brief series, uh, again, these are very, very acute um, um, follow-up periods. The, the discharge GCS, we did note some improvement in that. There were two complications. One was from a, a multiple uh, uh, trauma situation with non-survivable injuries, and the other one was just a, a devastating head injury. Uh, we, and we had two patients who returned for cranioplasty. Both, they were they had some uh, focal neurological deficits, but otherwise were independent. Uh, That's really heroic stuff. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's any questions. Um, well, I, I want to. Well, first of all, I just want to. I want to thank you myself for showing that case because it's good to see that it does work sometimes. And I mean that that was those were miraculous cases. And it's good for everyone to see that that is something that we should always consider in certain situations. I, before we go on, because we are running kind of late, but I want to know if any of the neurosurgeons here have any comments to make about this, or the neuro doctors, or anyone. Dr. Dr. Lang, are you still there? Dr. Keating? I feel I may be outnumbered. How about, how about, how about uh, Dr. Um, Meyer? Dr. Mayer. Yeah, this, uh, for, for this uh, bad situation, the outcome is very fine. And I wonder, did you store the, the, uh, the bone of the mm -hmm. decompressive craniotomy uh, in your institution and uh, implant it after several months? And uh, did you have any problem with the uh, Bullet fragments uh, like abscess formation or infections? Um, that's actually an excellent question because that was another area where I had to really think long and hard about. In the second case, I did uh, save that bone and place it in the subcutaneous pocket. But these kids probably, you know, uh, they have very little subcutaneous fat and are really worried that uh, they would erode through their skin or have other problems again. They were going to develop problems um, outside of the hospital upon their discharge, a late infection in the abdomen. Again, their capability of getting to a military or a medical facility at all is very limited. So I also had a long thought, you know, kind of internal monologue discussions about, about whether or not potentially creating a, a second site of surgery of infection could could harm me in the future. Um, I ended up fortunately getting a, a lot of titanium mesh donated to our hospital. So in the second instance, uh, the second phase, or in another cranioplasty patient, I was able to do 
the titanium mesh, but in the second case, I, he did uh, have his uh, bone explanted from his abdomen and, and replaced. Dr. Park, thank you so much for that uh, lecture. I, like I said, I think that that's a, a good case for us all to see. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. We're going to move on now to the last section of the entire show. Dr. Mary Fallett's going to round out the show for us. Dr. Fallett, are you there? I am. You're like a you're like a, a veteran with these shows, right? You've you've been on before. <laughs> I have. <laughs> well, thanks for coming again, and thanks for being the uh, grand finale of our show here. Clean up hitter. Uh, the, the How are you doing, Mary? Good. Hello, Good Marty. to hear your voice. Good to hear your voice. Uh, Dr. Dr. Fallett is a professor and division chief of pediatric surgery in Louisville, and she's going to pre present a damage control laparotomy case. Okay. In the interest of time. I'm going to uh, fast forward, if I can, to, oh, my control's not working. That's right. Tell, uh, I can do it for you. Which slide do you go to, number, go to number three. OK. So this is a 16-month-old male child. He had about a 36-hour history of vomiting at home, feeling bad. The parents took him to a local hospital when he became obtunded. The local hospital inserted an IV. We got a call. They did a quick CT scan, and they transferred him to us basically in shock and respiratory failure. And he had the uh, lab work that you see on the slide when he arrived, and really was an extremist. And um, the abdomen was distended, and there were a large number of bruises on his abdomen. He was accompanied by his mother the day prior to this presentation. He had been in the care of his mother's boyfriend for several hours. So sadly, um, in Kentucky, we lead the nation in non-accidental trauma. Uh, this um, was no exception. And the CT scan, that image that you see there, um, suggests that this child had a pancreatic injury at the very least. Um, and he also had on other images a suggestion that he had free intraperitoneal air. Uh, so he was taken upstairs to the operating room. Uh, before we did anything, we inserted a central line. We made sure that we had started some uh, important fluid resuscitation, that we had blood available. Uh, that he was getting warmed. And when we opened, we found that he had a um, fractured pancreas. Uh, basically, the uh, injury had separated the pancreas enough that the operation was almost done for us. So that part wasn't really difficult to determine what to do. We did a, a distal pancreatectomy, splenic sparing. Um, but the next slide shows that he also had a duodenal injury with obvious um, bowel that looked compromised. So at this juncture, um, I'd just like to ask how people might approach this. So uh, it's hard for me to, to exactly tell. When we're looking at the duodenum there, what is this a complete uh, is this like an anterior wall duodenum? Is this um, more than 50 percent? It was. It was um, actually um, three, 75 percent. You're still on camera, Doctor. I want to be on camera. Okay. So um, let me. So I, I, I have my ideas, but I want to pull the audience. I'm, there's or just ask any of the other faculty and panelists. Would you uh, would you do sort of like a pyloric exclusion or? Uh, uh, drain the duodenum, or would you try to repair with the duodenal jejunostomy? What's that? Uh, w exactly yeah. where is this? This second portion, third portion, it's hard to tell. It is just distal to the ligament of trites. Oh. Distal. Did it look ischemic? Yes. But it was not, it was intact but ischemic. Is that the situation? Well, it's, the, the uh, defect is over 75%. So it's ripped open, it's just torn open, it's torn. Torn, and, and again, this is a injury that is over a day old. Over what? A day old. Oh, 24 hours old. 
So, Dr. Petty, what, what do you think? What would you do? Well, I mean, I think the damage control principles would probably be to oversew it, you know, temporary abdominal closure, and then re-explore it in a day or two when he was resuscitated and all that. And I think that's the time to make the harder decisions about how to reconstruct that. But at least in the heat of the battle, that's what I would start with. And then mm -hmm. trying to figure out what to hook up to what, I think. You're an orthopedic surgeon, but do you have an opinion here? You've been, uh, well, you've been very gracious. The, uh, well, this is in that, it's been a while since I've seen this. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the case is pretty striking. 15 months old with uh, abdominal bruising. You, obviously, you look everywhere else in the in elevated abdominal labs. We always actually teach our orthopedic residents that this has uh, got to be child abuse until you've proven otherwise. And they start hunt, on the hunt for looking other signs of injury. Um, I guess from my standpoint, I, I, I don't have much to offer as far as where to go with this uh, abdominal injury, but uh, clearly you got to look at everywhere else in the spine, the ribs, uh, kidneys, the retinal exam, all the other kind of standard uh, post-traumatic child abuse workups. Great. Dr. Dr. Ma 